Thank you very much, Martha Smith. I, I don't know whether I'll have to holler or not because I'm just used to talking loud. <laughs> so I don't have too much trouble having to carry my voice. But with this kind of introduction, Martha Smith is a very good friend of mine. I remember going on educational television with uh, Martha about two years ago here at the university in uh, Wisconsin. And honest to God, this woman tickled me to death. You know, I had all kinds of trouble. But she just brought all of that out, and for a while I could relax just doing this show with Martha Smith. Uh, I would like to say this is a beautiful audience out here to me this afternoon because I always like people. A couple of weeks ago I was doing a show in New York City for NBC in the role of a black woman and somebody asked the question during the time we was on this panel, how did I feel talking to a lot of people? I said, I feel like I always feel because I know out there in front of me is just some little folks. You know, so you don't have to worry about other people. You know, you get up and tell them the truth. Now, you might be expecting me to have a long essay <laughs> written down that I would have to use my glasses every five minutes and miss where I left <laughs> to rap and to tell you what it is and to tell it like it is. Um, as Martha said, I was born 53 years ago in Montgomery County. Now Mississippi, you heard about this twister the other week, but it was already a disaster area before the twister. <laughs> Disaster area, 53 years, I know, and people older than you said it was a disaster area before then. <laughs> I was born 53 years ago to Mr. and Mrs. Jim Town. And I am the 20th child. And so help me God, I respect my mother so much that they didn't have them birth control pills. Because if they had had them, I probably wouldn't be standing here today. So as I made that narrow escape to be here, I fight for the other kids too to give them a chance. Because if you give them a chance, they might come up being Fannie Lou Hamer and something else. But um, during the time I was a child, my education was very limited. Because I had to start work when I was six years old. I remember one day I was playing beside a gravel road and the landowner asked me could I pick cotton. And I told him I didn't know. And he told me he wanted me to go to the field that week and pick 30 pounds of cotton. I went to the field and I did pick 30 pounds of cotton. But the next week I was cast 60 pounds of cotton. And by the time I was 13 years old, I was picking two and three hundred pounds of cotton. My family was some of the poorest people that was in the state of Mississippi, and we were sharecroppers. Now, sharecropping is really something it's out of sight for. Number one, what I found since I've been old enough, it always had too many it in it. Number one, you had to plow it. <laughs> Number two, you had to break it up. Number three, you had to chop it. Number four, you had to pick it. And the last, number five, the landowner took it. <laughs> so this left us with nowhere to go. It left us hungry. Because my family would make 60 and 70 bales of cotton and we would pick all of the cotton. And then after we would finish picking the cotton, we would sometimes come out in debt. 
We never had so many days in my life that we had cornbread and we had milk and sometimes bread and onions. So I know what the pain of hunger is about. My father and mother finally got enough money out of one crop to buy some livestock when I was about 13 years old. And a man went down a lot one night and he wasn't black. And he takes about a gallon of Paris green and stirred it up in our livestock food and killed everything we had. At that point, my parents had bought three mules and two cows. The other bird and Henry was the mules and Maud and Della was the two cows. And they killed everything that we had. I used to watch my mother when she would come out of the field and she would have a big bundle of things by her side and she would mend our clothes over and over. And I watched her when she would wear things that were so heavy after she had mended them time after time. Looked like she would have trouble carrying them. At first I couldn't understand why this just always happened to black people. So I asked my mother one day, how come we wasn't white? The reason I asked her that because we worked all the time. The white folks never worked, and they had everything. Now this was really curious to me, as it still is. <laughs> so my mother told me, number one, she wanted me to remember to respect myself as a black guy. And I said, and she said, maybe you don't understand what I'm talking about now. But one day, if you respect yourself, other people will have to respect you. My grandmother was a slave. Liza Brown. Liza Goba Brown. She had 20 boys and three girls. And I know what had happened to us in the past. But after I become about 13 years old and find out how mean that people could be to people, I said that I was going to do something about what was happening in Mississippi. So that's the reason I become involved in politics in 1964. But it had been other things in my life that I had done that some of the white people don't know that I've done yet. <laughs> because number one, I always had to work at their house. So they would tell me that I couldn't eat with them or I couldn't bath in their tub. So what I would do was eat before they would eat and bath when they were gone. knowing they didn't want me in that tub and just relaxing in that bubble bath. <laughs> and then I would fill up with everything they put on them and walk out and they couldn't spell mine because they had the same thing on them. <laughs> so when they would say that I couldn't eat with them, it would tickle me because I would say to myself, baby, I'll eat first. <laughs> And one of the other things I done when I was a kid, and after I got to be a grown woman, you know, we had to wash, Mom. You know how we would have to carry clothes on to wash for the white people. And if they had a dance in 50 miles, I wore the best dress. Because I wore them clothes. <laughs> you know, we, we had to you know, I was rebelling in the only way that I could rebel. So what I'm saying to you, white America, Please don't say what black people can't do because some of the things we've been already doing. <laughs> the sad thing that has been in the whole country is what white America has done to us and how we can forgive. When I think about the question that comes up so often, about how six million Jews 
was destroyed under Hitler's administration. I felt the kinship because it wasn't six million of my people destroyed. It was 40 million of my people destroyed as they were bringing my ancestors here on the slave ships of Africa. When I think about the crime that's been committed against us as human beings and as people, I can forgive easily for a lot of things. But when white America take in my name, that was a crime. I went some time ago to Charleston, South Carolina, and I looked at the documents there. And some of the documents there would say, would call the name of a person and said, she doesn't have any education, but she's a good breeder. $25. I saw where my people had been sold to Spain and not human beings. And I think about some of our past history. When you never taught us white America, that it was a black doctor that learned to save blood plasma to give a blood transfusion. You never taught that in the institution. And you never taught us that the first man to die in a revolution was Christopher Atta, another black man. And so many other things that I've found out and so many things that I've found out about the church. If you really want to see some hypocrites, if you really want to see some hypocrites, go to 11 o'clock church service throughout the country. Not only in the black churches, but in the white churches. While they will tell us and tell you it's scared, well, those people are all right, but just don't bring them home with them. But the contribution that we have made in the past, and we know as well as you know, that this country was built on the blood and the sweat of black people. And all we are saying to you today now what you have done in the past, you've done that. But we can't let you get away with just trying to wipe us out as human beings. And some of the black folks have got so confused, they talking about setting up seven states with us, which I refuse to let them do. Setting up seven states with us, and one night the White Citizens Council and the Ku Klux Klan and the verses which you have here to wipe us out. And I'm not going in seven states by ourselves. We plan to be in this country with you, whether you want us here or not, and we plan to make this a better place for all the citizens both black, red, white, and brown, and we want to know. I've never been hung up in all of my work in just fighting for the black. I've never been hung up in that because I know that a lot of black people have given their lives. But I also know it was people like Andy Goodman, Michael Swern, and James Shane that gave their lives in the state of Mississippi that all of us would have a better chance. And when they died there, they didn't just die for me, but they died for you because your freedom is shackled and chained to mine. And until I'm free, you 
you are not free either. And if you think you are free, you drive down to Mississippi with your whip punches, glasses, and plates, and you will see what I'm talking about. These are the kind of changes that we have to have. And these are the kind of changes that we are going about. In 1964, when we went to the Democratic Convention in Atlantic City and challenged the seating of the representatives of the delegation from Mississippi, when they turned us down and told us to accept two votes at large, I told them at that time, 68 people was there in that delegation, and all of us were tired. In 1968, we came back to Chicago, and we won our seat. 64 hours in the convention, out of the convention, wishing I could go in. In 1968, I was in there wishing I could get out. convention all the way. <laughs> because I had never in my life seen in the land of the free and the home of the brave, which we have translated in Mississippi as the land of the tree and the home of the grave, <laughs> I have never seen a convention that had to be held with fixed banners, with rights. That means they would stick you if you stand there and shoot you if you run. <laughs> I was in that convention and I made, I made the some of them guys they had trailing me. I made them out visible. I don't know what he's an FBI, a central intelligence agent, or what the hell he was, but he was that. <laughs> See, and what happened all my life, I've been behind white people and I watched. See, that's why you made your mistake, white America. You put us behind you and we watch. Now we know you and you don't know us. <laughs> so I watch this guy while he'd be watching me. And whenever I got ready to dodge him, I'd put this dog to him. And they must have told him, you better not let her get out of your sight. Because this little man had some of the stabbing little blue eyes, and he'd be ducking through that convention, I'd be standing on land. And after I would just let him go through total hell, I would step out where I could see him, and you could just see him just release all the <laughs> You would have to be in that convention to know what we are faced with today when we said with the people, for the people, and by the people. That's a lie. It's with a handful, by a handful, by a handful. <laughs> because I know sometime when some of the votes would come up and they said all in favor of so-and-so happening, say I. Ten people would say I. Said the contrary said nay. A half a million said no. They said hi. But we had to give up because with the young people of today, we are going to make democracy a reality for all of the people. And I don't want you telling me to go back to Africa unless you're going back where you come from. me to go back to Africa. And ever since that time, it's been three times a week I said, when I'm in a white audience, I said, we'll make the deal. After you send all the Koreans back to Korea, the Chinese back to Chinese, the Jewish people back to Jerusalem, the Koreans back to Korea, 
and you give the Indians their land back, and you get on the Mayflower from which you come, And we know what has happened in the past with food stamps, welfare, and all of this kind of stuff. And it's not only in the South, it's up South and down South, <laughs> where our people have suffered from malnutrition. One of my daughters stayed in the hospital six weeks, suffering from malnutrition. And I remember other things with other people where kids literally starved almost to death. And then I start traveling throughout this country to try to do something about the problem. So I would come to Madison, Wisconsin, New York City, California, and all over the country trying to raise funds to purchase food stamps. But the real crime, I think it's a crime, that if a man and woman is hungry, that they have to pay for the food stamps when thousands of people in the state of Mississippi have made less than $500 in 1970. So one day, a man called and said he had some land. He had 40 acres of land and he wanted to sell the 40 acres. So I called a very small organization here in Madison West Punches called Measure for Measure. Martha Smith is a part of that organization. Jeff Goldstein, Sarah Broccoli. And it's a small organization. But I called them and told them about the 40 acres of land. And if we could get the 40 acres of land to grow our own vegetables and to grow our cattle and to grow our folk, we could wipe out hunger in Sunflower County. I called another friend of mine who was at Harvard University in charge of the political science there, and he also started raising my tutor. We finally succeeded in getting 40 acres of land. And this land is all organized and founded in 69. It's called Freedom Farms Cooperative. Last summer we fed a lot of people there. But then we needed more land. So it was a man told me one day that he would sell 640 acres of land. And you know, it was just like I'd been hearing in the past that, oh, it ain't nothing to that. We might get two or three dollars, but we'll have to try. Last April, we were able to put $20,000 in the And you know, it was just like I'd been hearing in the past that, Oh, it ain't nothing to that. We might get two or three dollars, but we'll have to try. Last April, we were able to put $20,000 of the option on the 640 acres of land. Then on the 14th of January, 1971, we finished the down payment of $65,000 
gain any kind of political power unless we have some kind of economic power. And all the qualifications that you have to have to become a part of the core, and you have to be full. This is the first kind of program that has ever been sponsored in this country in letting local people do their thing that they Because I've seen government-funded programs with cooperatives, and after you get through making the proposal with a stack of paper this high, and after you finish paying all the administration from 25000 to 12000 it'd be exactly $2 to go to the program. <laughs> the only person that's paid at this point is the secretary. And you, tell, you don't tell me that you can't change a man's mind by not paying. We have gone through kind, all kinds of pressure. But I refuse to hate a man because he hates me. Because if I hate you because you hate me, it's no different. Both of us are miserable. And we're going to find a task something hated. But as a result of what I can give of myself, that I can love you if you hate me, we have poor white that's coming into this organization and we are going to feed not only the black people of Sunflower County, but all the people that come with regardless of color. And the young people are the people that made this possible for us. You know, I just about fell out with all of the people my age, I'm 53, and most of them my age are hopeless case. <laughs> but I am 53, but I think 19. And they talking about how old people can't relate to them after you've not kids. I don't understand what's wrong with those people. <laughs> I'm not going back with every step I'm going back. And it's been a sad thing that happened in Mississippi recently. We had a twister that hit several counties in the state of Mississippi. The Red Cross came, and after they was there two days, I told them if I go to heaven and see the Red Cross sign, I would tell the administration to let me go back home. Because <laughs> they were a hopeless case. <laughs> people are suffering because it didn't just only kill people, but it's people now that want to put the trailer houses where they don't have any kind of sewage. But you got to care enough to do something. <coughs> because what you do here in Madison, West Hudson, at that, this university, you're not only doing this for us in the South, but you're doing it for yourself. I've noticed what was happening with the young world development with the wall. The walk that will be held on the 8th and 9th of May. I see this as an opportunity of bridging the gap between young people. Bridging the gap because not only do I think that white children and young white men and young white women should walk, but I think it's a responsibility of the black people to walk here too. And as they walk throughout this country with 350 walks in this country and 40 other countries funding it, a bus in the walk, there will be millions of people walking throughout the country, out the world. Because one thing I find out, that is not only hungry in the state of Mississippi, but two-thirds of the people in the world are hungry. 
And we have to be concerned. And you have to be concerned here. Because we know with the administration that we have today, there's not too many people going to eat. But I want you to know one thing. That President Nixon wasn't no fool when he got at you. Because that's his safety. Nobody is going to hurt President Nixon to leave us standing with Sparrow <laughs> But all of you here have to be concerned. Not only do we have to be concerned about hunger, but we also have to be concerned about peace in this country. You know, it's something strange to me when they tell me that we are over there in Vietnam fighting for the right for people to elect their government and all of this kind of crap with Eastern and Senate helping to make policies when we can't do it in Mississippi. And you young people are going to have to help make this change. Because we can't continue on the same way, expanding the war in Vietnam, killing the people over there, and people being shot down in the streets throughout this country sometimes in the name of law and order. I've been to jail. And I've been beaten in jail till my body was hard as metal. And I've been charged with disorderly conduct and resisting arrest. And there's a lot of other young people throughout this country that has been beaten down. But I want you to know something in this audience today. A house divided against itself cannot stand. A nation divided against itself is on its way out. We are going to have to stand up and make demands that will make this country worthwhile. Because I have trouble today, and I've had trouble in the past few years. <clears throat> when I got out of jail and couldn't hardly sit down, and a man carried me to see the Statue of Liberty. And a woman standing with a torch and facing another problem. I told the man that I was riding with that day, I said, I would like to see this statue turned around to face her own problem. And the torch out of her hand with her head bowed because we have problems in this country is they try to point to another country. I can't stand today not with dignity and sang the national anthem. Oh say can you see by the dawn of the light what so proudly we hate. Poor oppressed people throughout this country don't have anything to hate. And I just sing it in my own way when I have to sing, stand and sing that song. Because you know as well as I know that America is sick and man is on the critical list. And when people can be shot down at a college like Kent and a college like Jackson State College, by people that's dying in the arm, is something very wrong. <laughs> I call the National Guard draft dogs. Not only have they dogs being drafted, but they was caught looting in southern Mississippi after the storm. We have to work to make this a better place. And we have to deal with politics 
and the history of this country that's not in the book. You know, we've been reading about what was in the book. You know, about Columbus discovered America. And when he got here, there was a black brother that worked up there and said, let me help you, man. And there was some Indians here, too. So how could he discover what was already discovered? The education has got to be changed in these institutions. Thousand pages of evidence 